And sometimes you could tailor it to, if you're getting all, uh, let's say you're getting all thoughts, 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 and, and no feelings. I could say this time, when you follow my fingers, keep following my fingers until a feeling comes up or an image comes up. Mm. And so it's a way of modifying the protocol when you're stuck. In this video, I'm talking with Dr. Robert Tinker. Let me just say that the world would have been a better place if we had more people like Dr. Tinker. He is a first generation EMDR therapist and a trainer. He was there right from the beginning. The first um, study he published on EMDR was in 1995. Dr. Tinker trained hundreds of therapists all over the world and has been involved in many humanitarian projects that involve the use of EMDR in many countries. In 2014, he received the Francine Shapiro Award for all the work he has done. Toward the end of the interview, Dr. Tinker shares his pioneering EMDR work with children. Uh, he's the one who started EMDR with children and a modification he did to the standard protocol that he continues to use with good results. <music> Dr. Robert Tinker, welcome to the Art and Science of EMDR, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to talking about things that I'm really interested in that I think are intrinsically interesting and exciting. Bob, I am so grateful to have you uh, on the show. I know you've done a lot of things for the EMDR community, and really for the world. So among other things, you, you pioneered EMDR work with children. You published studies in, I think, first time 1995. Uh, you've been involved in many, many humanitarian projects all over the world, including training indigenous therapists in Rwanda and setting up the free EMDR clinic after the Oklahoma City bombing uh, and many other projects. So can we start talking about that, about your humanitarian work? I'd be glad to. And what I'll say initially about the humanitarian work is though I might say I did such and such, I'll probably more often say we did such and such because I'm indebted to two colleagues that were more than colleagues. I, they're both deceased now, and I want to honor them as being a intrinsic and really important part of what we did. One is my late wife, Dr. Sandra Wilson, who I met through EMDR, and we began working together, and we had 25 years together that were exciting, rewarding, productive and loving. And the second person is Dr. Lee Becker, who is, uh, was a professor emeritus in psychology at UCCS. And uh, he was pivotal in providing statistical and scientific support with us. Um, Sander was pivotal with respect to providing administrative control and, and energy and team building. And through the three of us, we built teams on these projects that we did, which none of us could do alone. And when we did research, I became aware that it was almost impossible to do research based on knowledge from one person. We needed Sandra's expertise in administrative, getting things done, Lee's expertise in, in doing the statistics. And I was the person who was kind of in charge of 
the, the clinical aspect of things. So we, we used to joke that between the three of us, we had one good brain and we had the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and the corpus callosum. And I'm not sure who was the corpus callosum. Anybody? Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah. you can take turns when you have three brains. So I want, and... Yes, so I wanna honor them uh, as being a part of just about everything we talk about. Yeah, um, and I know you've done um, some publishing really early in the you know development of EMDR, and I want to ask you about that. But first, I want to our listeners to hear about a little bit about the humanitarian work that you've done. I know that you know if we we had to go get into details, we can spend the next three hours talking about it. But can you say you know a little bit about the humanitarian work that you've done um, all over the world with EMDR? Um, we got called to go to various places because we had published um, and because we did trainings, we got called to probably the first place was Dunblane, Scotland. There was a shooter in Dunblane, Scotland who killed a number of children in an elementary school and it was horrific. And so we went, we got asked to go to Dunblane, Scotland and we trained therapists in the school system to deal with the trauma of the children. And through EMDR, it was interesting that within a year of that training uh, in the UK, it became almost impossible to own handguns, that they changed their laws. So um, they acted on the gun aspect pretty immediately. Um, after that, we, I, I would say the thing that I, I'm probably most proud of is when we went to Oklahoma City after the bombing, um, Lee Becker and Sandra Wilson and myself, within a, a week or two of the bombing, we went to Oklahoma City, saw the devastation, said something must be done. Uh, we had just gotten word that our article had been published uh, in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology. And we were pretty confident based on that research that was accepted for publication that we could form a team that would provide humanitarian relief to persons who were traumatized by the bombing. And through that, well, what happened is Sandra stayed in Oklahoma City and set up an EMGR free clinic. I would commute on weekends and as clinical director. And also I would treat people on weekends. So I'd have my regular practice during the week and during the weekends, what I would do is, is fly in work with clients who are traumatized. We worked with a lot of first responders and, um, and it was tough initially to work with first responders. They were required to participate in CISM or CISD, that's Critical Incident Stress Debriefing, in which after working for a day at the bomb site, they would have to gather together and talk about their feelings. And they hated it. And they hated it because they had to go back to the bomb site the next day and, and work. And, and to do that kind of horrific work, they had to keep blinders on. And to take those blinders off when they didn't want to and when they weren't done with what they were doing was, was very difficult and upsetting to them. And so uh, we began to get referrals from the first responders when they simply were not able to function. They, they couldn't function on their job. They couldn't function with their families. The, they couldn't sleep at night. They, they were so disturbed that friends or family 
or their coworkers would bring them in and say to us, this person is not functioning, really needs help. And so we would then uh, begin working with somebody who was initially pretty distrustful. But after a while, they said it's the only thing that worked for them. And they also would joke with each other and say, are you a member of the club? <laughs> and so it became openly talked about, openly accepted, and a, and a real turnaround from the initial hostility uh, toward debriefing that they had had. Um, and as a result of this free clinic that was set up, um, we were able, well, we had previously formed a 501c3 called the Spencer Curtis Foundation. It was named after two of our grandchildren who had died shortly after birth. And um, the mission statement for the Spencer Curtis Foundation was to provide psychological services for humanitarian purposes. So it was in the right direction. We were there as an entity and then it allowed for people to donate to an entity. So donate rooms for the people who flew in, the, the MDR therapists who flew in to be the therapists um, in the free clinic, to have transportation donated. Um, and, but people volunteered, they flew in on their own money and but we provided housing and we provided office space and we provided transportation to keep the free clinic going it was there for six months as part of the project we we worked with about 250 clients we flew in on a weekly basis emdr therapists were trained at the highest level and so they would stay for a week and one thing we learned about the EMDR protocol is it was so transferable with good notes, you could pick up where the previous therapist had left off. And so some people had three therapists, like one for the first week, a second therapist for the second week and a third for the third week. And EMDR notes, you know, with showing where you left off in the therapy could be picked up by the following therapist. And it happened rather seamlessly. We were delighted to find that persons didn't object to having a different therapist each time. We kept the same one as much as we could, but sometimes it was three different therapists. That, that's very interesting. So yeah, three different therapists, so one picks up where the, you know, the second picks up where the first one left off. and and you saw good results with that. Right, right. Yeah. Um, it didn't seem to impair the effectiveness um, in any kind of way. Um, in fact, in some ways it might've been better because you get slightly different viewpoints. And um, so we kept that clinic going for six months and it fit very much with Francine's ideas to have a humanitarian function with respect to the EMGR Institute. And so they then were able to apply for uh, 501c3 status. And it became a joint project between the Institute and the Spencer Curtis Foundation and um, led to the formation of HAP, the Humanitarian Assistance Programs, and which function kind of like uh, Doctors Without Borders, that when there was a catastrophe or some kind of uh, weather event or, or war event, that persons could go and provide psychological services through HAB, um, just like doctors went to provide medical services through 
Doctors Without Borders. Um, we also, as part of that, HAP uh, and Spencer Curtis combination of services, we trained over 350 therapists uh, in, from Oklahoma City. When we started, there was nobody in Oklahoma City who was fully trained in EMGR. And so we, we made sure that we trained people, they, we trained them. Francine Shapiro did part of the training. Uh, I did some of the training EMGR with children at the time. And uh, through that, uh, others, after we shut down the Spencer Curtis Foundation Clinic, um, other persons could carry on the EMGR work following the bombing. Uh, yeah, so, so Bob, I wanted to ask you, I know that you've done trainings. Um, you've, you've been one of the early stage trainers of EMDR uh, and you've done trainings really in a lot of different parts of the world. Can you say, you know, can you mention what, what countries you've trained um, therapists in EMDR to become EMDR therapists? Be glad to. Um, the first training that we did uh, in a foreign country was in Bergen, Norway. Um, and um, we were invited there by Atla Durgrav, who was a psychologist who worked with UNICEF and the World Health Organization. And um, Roger Solomon did the training for adult work with EMDR. And I did the training with Sandra Wilson for the child portion. And what I remember is there was one person in particular in that training who was so skeptical when I showed a video of EMGR with a 10 year old, she insisted that it must be a child actor. And then I showed a video of an eight year old and she insisted it must be a child actor. But when we got to age four, and age two, she could no longer <laughs> insist. They must have been really good actors, the four-year-old <laughs> and two-year-old. Right. So, so, and to her credit, she became a leader with EMDR throughout the UK and Europe and helped us get designated as the for EMDR Europe, the child trainers for EMDR Europe. And we set up a program that was each country that we worked in would have, would be able to designate a, a leader uh, head for child EMDR, EMDR with children. And that leader would be able to set things up to handle the language of the country, the, the customs of the country and, and the legal requirements that were needed in each country. And, and we set up the first behavioral program that each person to get uh, qualified as a leader in these European countries, they would have to have a good tape with a one to two year old, another good tape with a three to four year old, a five to seven year old and, a, and an eight to 10 year old. They would have to submit videos that would be rated. And, um, and so we actually, I know that we offended some people because they were bright, articulate people, but they didn't do a good job in working with children. And we had to say, no, these tapes don't qualify. Um, the major problem was that they were leading Instead of following the process, they were leading the process and we mm -hmm. couldn't get them to stop leading the process. It wasn't coming from a child, it was coming from the therapist and we, we couldn't accept some of the videos on that basis. Um, yeah, so, so, so while, while we're on the topic of 
EMDR with children. I know that you're really, you pioneer the work, um, the EMDR work with children. And I found it fascinating uh, that in her book, A Therapist Guide to EMDR, Laurel Purnell talks about your EMDR therapy, a, a case, specific case of working with a two-year-old. So how do you work with, with a two-year-old? How do you do EMDR with a two-year-old? Well, let me tell you, this child that she was referring to um, was the first time I had worked with a child that young. Uh, the child was referred to me by a psychiatrist. And what had happened is the child had been born with fetal alcohol syndrome. And part of that syndrome, he was born with a cleft palate. And at age uh, 14 months, he had surgical repair of the cleft palate. And he came to during the surgery. And so following the surgery, he had night terrors on a nightly basis. Um, he became terrified when he saw a hospital gown. He got terrified when he went back to a hospital setting. He even got terrified when they went to the mall to take uh, photos, child photos of him. And when they turned on the large photographic lights, he, he screamed and cried and went into a panic because they were like the large surgical lights. And, and so they knew that there was a memory there. And, um, and so when I got the referral, I saw him for the first time and he was developmentally delayed. Uh, with language, he, uh, although he was 20 months of age when I saw him, um, he had the receptive and expressive speech of a one-year-old. So even though he was chronologically two years old, he was more like a one-year-old uh, in terms of his cognitive development and speech development. Um, and when I saw him, he was so hyper aroused that I couldn't even get him to make eye contact, let alone follow my fingers or something like that. And so I called the psychiatrist back and in the middle of saying, uh, no, I didn't see a way to work with him. I thought about somebody had told me that another therapist had used hand taps like patty cake with a very young child. And so in the next session, what I did is I had him play patty cake with me as much as possible. We didn't focus on anything except the, the tapping back and forth. So we made it a game. And, um, and then in the session after that, uh, I had given a lot of thought. I just, I thought I was working from the idea that somehow I had to evoke the memory and then pair that with bilateral stimulation. And I wasn't sure how I'd evoke the memory, but I, I hit upon the idea that perhaps what I could do is say, emotionally toned, emotionally charged words that he might recognize and that that might evoke the memory for him. And so I knew certain words might work like doctor, hospital, these would be emotionally charged and uh, lip hurt, mouth hurt, uh, big light because I knew about the episode in the mall, so big light or bright light. And, and so in that session, he was able to sit on a chair and, and do tapping. And I said the word bright light. And he said, to my surprise, he said big light. 
So I could tell that a connection was being made. And then when I, then I switched to big light and he repeated big light. And then I said, mouth hurt. And he said, my mouth hurt. Mm. And I said, lip hurt. And he said, my lip hurt. And the entire session was maybe five minutes in length. The grandparents, the maternal grandparents who were raising him, took him back home. And they, to their surprise, woke up the next morning, the sunlight streaming in the room. They panicked, rushed in to see. He was fast asleep. He had slept through the night for the first time. And he never had another night terror. When he turned six uh, and was cutting teeth, they, were, they had some concern that maybe he would regress because of the pain in the mouth area of, of cutting adult teeth. He didn't regress. And when uh, I last heard from him, he was attending junior college. Oh, wow. And, and he had, but he had good help all the way through. He had good speech therapy, you know, occupational therapy, physical therapy, as, as any child should have who is developmentally delayed. But he now, after that, he was, he still had high problems with hyperactivity, but, and hyperarousal, but it was, it was no longer PTSD on top of everything else. And he could get good therapy of various kinds for the other developmental delays and and um, and good parenting on the part of the, the grandparents. Of course. Um, Bob, one of the things that, um, it, one, one of the most interesting things that I found with your work with children is a variation of the standard protocol in which you let the client decide when to stop the BLS, which I find really interesting because I know that in EMDR trainings, we are being taught to do exactly 24 to 30, or, you know, some would say 32, but um, there's a very specific range that we're supposed to do, or we're being taught to do. And then you found that it actually works really well that you let the client choose when to stop the BLS. And if, if I'm, remember correctly, it started with children and then you tried it with adults and you've seen really good results with that. Yes, um, I, I use it 90% of the time, but I started using it with children and I started using it with children because I remember the first kid that I worked with who I would say, you know, follow the end of my pen or follow my fingers. And what do you get now after 32 back and forth or, but, um, and the child would say nothing and I'd set it up again, would go through the eye movements and nothing, nothing. And so finally I said, this time, when you follow my fingers, just keep following my fingers until something new or different comes up. And it opened the floodgates. I thought, wow, that he didn't have the idea of associative chaining. He didn't get that. And yet it was probably going on. And my giving permission to say, follow my fingers until something new or different comes up. Then he kind of got the idea. And it worked so well with him that whenever I had other kids who didn't do any kind of, had trouble with associative chaining, that I would say, follow my fingers until you get something new or different. And sometimes you could tailor it to, if you're getting all, uh, let's say you're getting all thoughts, 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 thoughts. And, and no feelings. I could say this time, when you follow my fingers, keep following my fingers until 
a feeling comes up or an image comes up. Mm. And so it's a way of modifying the protocol when you're stuck. Uh, you could consider it a certain kind of interweave like uh, other interweaves that get talked about. Um, so, and I began applying it to adults as well and it worked, seemed to really work well with adults. I think there's so much doctrinaire uh, in terms of training, it clarifies training, but uh, it, it, if more clinicians worked with children, I think they'd be less rigid about 32 or 30 movements back and forth because children are less predictable. You have to be more flexible in working with children. And, um, and so, um, so I, I actually, have come to believe that even the intention of moving the eyes back and forth can cause bilateral stimulation. Um, oh, uh, that's, I, I find it really interesting. So you're saying that in your EMDR work these days with adults, mm -hmm. you're still using a lot of that. You're letting the, the client decide when they stop the BLS. Yeah, it, it turns over more of the session to the, to the individual who is in therapy. And you end up going more at their pace and less at your pace, more at their pace. Yeah, so that it's, makes, it's a way makes of, sense. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's worth, it's the kind of thing that's worth a try. Um, and I think it, it, I actually think it accelerates the changes uh, that it's it's more it's more like a dance. That uh, I mean, Ian Dare is like a dance anyway, but it's like a dance where the client gets to lead more, and it goes where they want to go more quickly and easily than the standard protocol. When I do teach, I emphasize what the standard protocol is and how this is a deviation from the standard protocol. And for them to be aware of it is a change from the standard protocol and to use it if it's helpful, so. Yeah, and very interesting, Bob. So before we say goodbye, Bob, I have one more question for you. And it's a question that I ask every person that I interview. And the question is, how do EMDR therapists get better at being EMDR therapists? I think they get better by attending EMDR conferences. Um, the, the rubbing shoulders with colleagues is so important. It's a friendly atmosphere. It's a, a, a charged atmosphere in the sense that people are excited about what they're doing. I remember in the beginning days that um, I think EMDR therapists were intimidated, intimidating to non-EMDR therapists because we got so excited about what we were doing and the kind of changes we saw happening. And other therapists would, would hear that and be a bit intimidated by the amount of enthusiasm that they were seeing and hearing. And so that's still there in a positive way at, at the conferences. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of enthusiasm. There's acceptance of new ideas and different applications of EMDR. And so that's one way. Um, online learning is another way. Um, and, but a therapist's own experience is important in terms of being in their own therapy. And, and then the consultation is, is so important at the beginning stages to be able to find out where things are getting hung up and how to do things differently if, if something comes up that's, that's awkward or not, raises uncertainty about what's happening.
Absolutely. Yeah, consultation is, is crucial for development of development of EMDR therapists. Yeah, it's a different mental framework. You you listen differently with EMDR. You listen for targets. <laughs> you know that you, you you do a little earmarking and you think, oh, that's a target. Right, right, right. I, I I often think about myself when I'm doing an, an intake for you know first session. I'm like, oh, that that's a target. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay, Bob Tinker, thank you so much uh, for your time. I really, really appreciate your time and, and really everything you've done for us EMDR therapists, for the development of EMDR, and really the good things that you've done in the world. Thank you. Well, Rotem, thank you so much. I, I really feel uh, appreciated and understood by the extent to which you have honored uh, the things that have been done uh, over a 30 year period of time that um, when I look back on all the ways that I've been involved in EMDR and, and it's, it's, been, it's been fantastic uh, to be part of that and to have colleagues to be part of it with, so. Right, and I, I feel like we could, you know, we could keep talking for several more hours. I know you're, you were the, um, the recipient of the Francine Shapiro Award and you've done so much work that I think, you know, um, compacting it to, you know, our 30 minute conversation um, is not really not enough, but um, in, in this format, um, this is what we have. So um, again, thank you, Bob. Thank you. You're very kind. And I uh, really applaud and admire what you're doing in terms of the interviewing. Yeah.